Good afternoon and welcome to this Lunch with DNP FNP faculty webinar from the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. I'm Rebecca Badeau, Communications Director for the School of Nursing, and this afternoon I will serve as your host. We want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us to learn a little bit more about the Doctor of Nursing Practice program here at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. This is really a casual webinar. We really want to get you involved um, in asking questions and engaging with some of our DNP FNP faculty. It's an opportunity to find out why they chose to get a DNP degree, the courses that they're planning on teaching in this program, and the mentorship that they will provide the clinical students who are part of our program. We really want to provide an opportunity for prospective students to really hear directly from faculty about their vision for the program and what makes it unique. Of course, all of our program requirements, the details, the eligibility, the application process, all of that can be found on our website. We'll share that URL with you a bit later, but we won't really be addressing that today. This is a chance for us um, to really dive deeper and, and get a sense and a feeling of the people behind the program, um, their inspiration for the degree, and then maybe what you can um, expect out of the program. Uh, Use the Q&A function, please. We will definitely be uh, taking questions from you today um, so that you can engage a little bit more. Uh, and remember, all the details on the website. Also, we are recording this webinar today and we will be providing it to you in a follow-up email tomorrow in case you had a colleague or a friend who had hoped to join and for some reason um, were not able to do so. Or if you don't catch all the information today, you'll be able to chance to listen to it again. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Catherine Sexton, the director of the DNP FNP program. Dr. Sexton. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm happy to be here today to introduce everyone to a few members of our DNP FNP faculty team. I've been asked to share a little bit about my background as an educator and as an FNP, and joining me today will be Ron Ardona, Chris DeBellin Wilson, and Laura Van Ocker. So just to share with you a little bit about me, I obtained my FNP in Alaska and then obtained a subspecialty in geriatrics and a doctorate from Oregon Health and Science University. I've been practicing for almost 20 years. Hard to believe it's been that long. The majority of my time was spent in my own practice, seeing everyone from grandbabies to grandparents and time split between the city and flying out to places off the road system in a little two-seater airplane or on a snow machine to deliver care to folks who otherwise couldn't get into the city to be treated. I've been teaching longer than I've been an MP, starting out with pre-licensure students and then combining post-licensure students after I obtained my master's. After helping to launch several practices in Alaska who could see geriatric patients and knowing my patients would be well cared for, I came to Davis as part of the Family Caregiving Institute to create a program that would help healthcare professionals understand the needs of family caregivers and how to truly integrate them into the team rather than delegating tasks to them. As the research showed that we thought we were awesome at doing that, but the family caregivers didn't have quite the same impression. So really trying to move the needle there because so many of us are involved in family caregiving. Then, you know, as a group, we decided to offer a practice doctorate. And together with some very gifted colleagues, some of whom you're going to hear from today, in just a minute, and we crafted a vision of the DMP of the future with the ability to not only practice at the bedside, but really translate evidence into practice to affect better patient outcomes and the ability to collaborate to transform the system from addressing social injustice and equity issues to the way we actually deliver quality care to our individual patients and their communities. So 
without further ado, Rebecca, you want to take it away? I will, Catherine. And, and uh, uh, you know, if anything that would get you here from Alaska, it was to put you in a sandbox, which was creating this program. And I can always tell when you're talking about it, how enthusiastic you are about the program and what it's going to begin offering students um, this summer. Somebody else who, as, as Dr. Sexton referenced, is Dr. Ron Odana, a clinician educator with the School of Nursing. Dr. Odana, thank you so much for being with us today. And I guess really I want to know why you chose to earn a Doctor of Nursing practice degree and what it's meant for you professionally. Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here and great to be part of this team. Um, I, background wise, I've worked in diff different settings. Um, as a bedside nurse, I did acute care and actually float, I was in the float pool, floated everywhere. ER, burn ICU, med surge, telemetry. Um, when I did my NP, I stayed away from acute care, did some long-term care um, roundings in skilled nursing facilities. Um, currently, I am doing private practice, doing medical house calls. It's called home-based primary care. <clears throat> and what it's doing is it's showing me the unique perspective of being in acute care before, in long-term care, and now I'm down in the primary care uh, continuum of care. Um, I see a lot of disparities for those who are able to afford to go to a doctor's clinic and those who cannot. I've also seen how just because they are homebound, they're not able to see the, a regular physician or a practitioner in a regular clinic. So what drove me to do uh, to go into a DNP program for myself was that I needed to see a little bit more of a wide view of what's going on. Um, and a DNP uh, degree shows you a more population focused perspective in addition to what we do day to day in the grind of the health of healthcare practice. Uh, so the DNP really provided me with that view, the understanding a deeper knowledge and the nuances of the big picture. Um, so I encourage everyone to go into this program. Uh, it has also provided me with the knowledge and tools to test theories and research that are available out there. And really the DNP is a translation of this available evidence into practice such as what we did in our own private practice, we did transitional care management or TCM, incorporating that into a house call practice. And we found a lot of good things uh, with it, including reducing polypharmacy in the senior population that we served. Um, so the focus of DNP is really more clinical, a little bit of teaching and leadership versus research per se, um, although I get to support research and other scholarly projects. So in this uh, School of Nursing with a DNP uh, program, I'm looking forward to assisting some of the students with their scholarly project um, and furthering the translation of evidence into practice. Fantastic. And that research component is something that's um, very interesting. And I'm, I'm going to want to dive into that a, a little bit later, but not before we meet our next presenter is Dr. Chris DeBellin Wilson, who is a clinician educator and a family nurse practitioner. She's also currently completing her Doctor of Nursing Practice degree. So, um, Chris, while you're in it right now, why did you choose to pursue a DNP? So, um, Thanks for that question. And it was really good to hear what everybody's talking about in terms of systems. Soon to be doctor, doctor um, but I go by Chris. Um, I am in a doctoral um, NP program currently. So when I think about why I chose to be a DNP after about 17 years of being a nurse practitioner, um, I think about change agent. And I think that's sort of the theme you know, as nurses, nurse practitioners, we are change agents in the lives of the patients that we take care of. Um, and I've been really quite satisfied being that change agent into the patient's life. However, you know, being in nursing for this long and um, being in different facets of healthcare, my last gig before being part of UC Davis or the academic setting was doing corporate health and working for a health plan and really kind of zooming out to see how is it that nurses, nurse practitioners can really contribute to health in general. Um, I wished I had gone to my DNP earlier after, you know, before go going into that sort of job 
because it taught me ways of how do we look at systems, how do we address problems in healthcare, how do we use data to sort of create those solutions to solving healthcare. So part of the reason I joined the DNP program um, is to be really uh, adept and versed in looking at data, how to become a better leader, and how to look at systems so that I can take it to the front line and affect change that way. So I think being a change agent individually, but then zooming out and being a change agent um, systematically. And so I wanted more, I wanted more of that. So I have to ask you, uh, you said you wish you had pursued your DNP before the corporate work, but you also said you, a change agent is, is your focus. Now, going through a DNP program during COVID, when we're in a constant state of change, how has that perspective, constant change, change agent, how has it come together for you that now you will be um, a, a very different provider with that DNP? That's a very good question. So I'm at the end of my DNP project, and this is all about implementation. You've heard the word um, implementation science, translation science. And so when we're looking at evidence-based practice, now I'm taking it, in, I'm in clinic now. So I'm taking it into the clinical setting. And my project is about um, complex care management. And it's really looking at high-risk patients, those vulnerable, um, the things that Dr. O'Donna was talking about are, are how do we capture those patients in the front line. And so my project is about um, care management in an FQHC. I am integrating my NP students who are RNs, of course, and um, really managing those care management system, uh, care, um, doing care management around those vulnerable patients. So looking at the continuum of care from the acute care setting or the hospital into the primary care, how do we close the loop so that patients are not lost into this fragmented care? And so my project is around that. And being in this DNP project is showing me sort of how to hone in and how to finesse and maneuver systems. And then how do we, how do I become a leader so that I can spread this sort of program, this treat, you know, um, to, to higher ups. So being part of that conversation. Yeah, fantastic. While you're about to get that DNP degree, Laura Van Ocker, well, she's had that DNP for a little while. <laughs> Laura is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing. And, you know, Laura, you once told me you were very skeptical about the DNP. Why were you skeptical? And then what made you become a believer? Well, one of I'm actually one of the earliest MPs in California. I um, actually have hit my 40 years of practice, uh, which is puts it way back. I've been one of those um, people who wanted to be a nurse practitioner since I was 12 years old. So I have a long passion around this profession. And so when I had spent many years already as a nurse practitioner and the role of the DMP was being recognized. I had thought about getting a PhD in the past, but I've lived rurally and in underserved populations and there wasn't technology and access for that. And so I was really skeptical about why would I need a DMP when I was already functioning so well as, as a clinician. And I had actually practiced and had leadership, um, including in, in politics, uh, as a nurse entrepreneur, uh, having my own business. I've practiced in community health, tribal health, occupational health, and, and almost 30 years in family practice. And so it really was, what was I going to get about it? And part of it was, one, I had a passion to come back and teach. And I knew I needed more skills educationally to teach that best practice, that implementation science. But also I had been a voice and a leader and a speaker in the community, even testifying before the state legislature before for programs. And I realized that there's a respect that comes with an advanced degree, a terminal degree. And I wanted the strongest voice that I could possibly have with the skill set and the tools that would give me uh, those types of application skills. I also recognize that the PhD um, has a tremendous place uh, for defining the research and, and perhaps the solution for certain types of, of problems, but it's really the DMP that applies that research, puts it into evidence-based practice and reaches down to the client where we can really make change. And so when I applied to a PhD, 
PhD programs, um, they told me, Laura, you, you care about practice. You should be a DMP. And I said, I don't know if people are going to respect it. And they said, be a part of the change. And so I actually turned down the PhD offers and pursued the DMP as a change agent. And I learned more than I could ever believe about, uh, Chris was very articulate about the change agency, the implementation, uh, chaos theory and how it applies and disruption in the positive sense. So I, um, and especially educational technology, uh, pedagogy, so much that I learned in the DMP program, but really how to refine my, my voice in leadership and policy. I'm hearing some themes emerge and the reasons that all of you chose to do that. So um, I should mention in our, in a, in our uh, sense of being informal, I am using first names, not to diminish the importance and the authority that all of you carry. Um, but Catherine, let me go back to you. I, we touched on it a little bit earlier about your enthusiasm for the opportunity to create a new program. What has it been like developing this curriculum? Um, and what have you found most rewarding about the, you know, envisioning this DNP for the future? Oh my goodness, Rebecca, <laughs> where to begin? It has been such an inspirational journey as we've looked at the current state of healthcare and where the deficits were, not only from the perspective of providers and where they're located, but what we heard from patients, right? And the need to not only take exceptional care of them, but to address the inequities in care and in the system, understanding the drivers of inequities often come more from institutionalized practices like redlining and long-held historical perspectives that by their very nature actually created this multi-tiered system that we experience today. We also looked at the type of care we were providing and its complexities and realized that if you were ever going to graduate, we couldn't teach you every disease process known to man, but we could teach you about the concepts at play from inflammation to thermoregulation to all the physiologic concepts to culture to human sexuality to ethics and systems, population health, and many more concepts. And then we could use exemplars of the things that we commonly see in family practice to illustrate those concepts and how you would apply them. So, you know, in other words, teaching you how to think through the process, not to memorize what you do. And the most rewarding part, oh my goodness, okay. Um, I would say working with the faculty and students because we have existing master's students who wanted to participate in the development of the curriculum where they were seeing things in practice and wanted to share that with us so that we could encompass a more holistic approach to our curriculum. You know, so we have a myriad of perspectives that we use to design the curriculum that not only help new providers be thoughtful and skillful clinicians, but also be the drivers of the evolution of healthcare. Because frankly, spending the most money among nations with established healthcare systems and ranking 45th among 50 in positive patient outcomes is simply not acceptable. Right? So seeing a curriculum evolve that's really going to help you meet these needs through listening and working together with each other and our communities and knowing that you'll be equipped to make a difference through your commitment, tenacity and hard work. I would say that's probably the most wonderful gift of putting this together and probably the most wonderful gift of my entire career. And we are just, I mean, we're chomping at the bit to share all of this with you. We all get 
and obviously I just go blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well I, mean, I was gonna say I don't have a doctorate but the math doesn't add up when you look at the statistics the rankings and obviously what needs to be done in healthcare. Um, one of the reasons that healthcare is so expensive and things that constantly change are we're living longer so Ron with all of your geriatrics expertise I know you have had a hand in creating some of the curriculum that deals with the you know that geriatric part of the population what's it been like for you you taking these years of experience and now weaving it into courses and a curriculum? So it's for me, it's been a great learning experience, Rebecca. Um, it's a totally different universe out there teaching. Uh, I'm just now glimpsing into like what is what it's going on behind the doors of uh, the academe. Um, where, but, but I'm so glad that I'm still already practicing and doing clinical work because then I can relate the instances and the case that we present in the curriculum to real life situations. Um, I feel that um, we were not, just like when I was in nursing school, we have the, what we call the tower, ivory tower, because of course down here on, on the ground, it's a little bit different. Um, so I'm, it's been tremendous learning experience, but also I'm drawing upon my experiences as a, as a clinician um, and in helping promote and put together this curriculum for the DNP program. I'm curious because you do get that ivory tower perspective and it's been a few years since you were in nursing school. How important is it and, and how do you think it lends to the uniqueness of this program that we do have practicing professionals who aren't just reading textbooks, which Catherine would argue many are outdated. And I might bring that up a little bit later because I know we're questioning existing textbooks. But why do you think that lends uniqueness to the program that we have that so that students are learning real world instead of hypothetical and it might have been applicable 20 years ago? So I'm one of those number of uh, clinical professors, assistant clinical professor who continue to practice. And um, just like Chris, we are in, like I call, I always call it in the trenches. So we bring forth what we find because because policies and rules and billing, they change almost every day, especially with the current uh, pandemic. Um, so it's important that uh, the faculty part at least of the program comes from those who are practicing and can bring forth any changes that is happening on the ground. Um, so I think that's what I'm bringing as far as being part of this uh, faculty member. Thanks. I know, Chris, you um, as a clinician educator, you're precepting students. So you bring that that preceptor perspective as well as like that mentorship. So why do you like precepting students so much? And what is your role as a mentor in this program for the students? I love precepting. Um, I think like like just what Ron was saying, I'm on the front lines as well. And what I love about precepting or mentoring is when you know not only do we teach diseases and conditions and how do you treat with medications or interventions i i think the light bulb moment for me as a, as a as an educator is when when catherine is talking about social determinants of health or how things that out, happen outside the physical body affect patients health when students get that in the clinic, when they're talking to my patients who may speak a, a separate, a different language than them, or come from a different socioeconomic space than them, and they understand that maybe the medical jargon that I'm explaining to them might not get through, and how do I, how do I then explain this? How do I create the nuance of healing? Um, so that's my light bulb moment because they come out all really fabulous and they're really smart from the textbook, but now you're now you come into our world, we're going to take your foundational learning and then adjust and nuance this to real world clinical life patient life. I mean, some of the callers are maybe on here have been nurses for quite some time and, and maybe a few haven't, um, but you'll get that. And I think you, you see the humanity um, when you're with the patient and when the students get that, um, that's my light bulb moment. That's my gift at the end of the day. And they keep you on your toes, I know. They do. They do. 
I, uh, I want to let those of you who are uh, participating with us today to feel free to ask us some questions. Um, a few are coming in and we will get to those to the panelists in just a minute. But if you're thinking about something, um, throw it in the Q&A so that we can be sure uh, that we have time to get it. Laura, I want to your perspective on um, preparing, you know, future nurse practitioners. You've been here at the School of Nursing a few years now. Um, you've been, a, as you mentioned, a, a nurse practitioner for just a few years now. What is it about um, imparting your wisdom on this new, you know, this new generation of practitioners who have a completely different lens that they're going to bring as professionals um, to the profession? Well, one of the things that I think is so exciting about being a nurse practitioner is that it really is the cutting edge of, of medicine nowadays. We are not spending time with patients in the hospital, the acute care setting. We are predominantly caring for people in their homes like Rhonda's um, or in clinics. And having been in clinics for most of my career uh, with some part-time teaching, I made the decision to move to full-time teaching because I wanted to teach this next generation to have the passion um, that I do, but also the humility to recognize that you can't be taught everything. You're going to be a lifelong learner. And like uh, Catherine said, you have to learn conceptually in order to learn uh, the flexibility of clinical reasoning and clinical practice and working in low resource settings. Um, so what's important is 85% of what I learned at nurse practitioner school, I've had to learn 85% more since. We are lifelong learners, self-educators, and that's the model to come with humility. It's okay to not know everything, but I know I can learn everything uh, with, the, with the peers, with uh, evidence-based practice. And so that's what I wanna teach is the conceptual-based learning as opposed to rote memory. So you're gonna get open thinking and challenge in this program. Uh, we want you to be a thinking uh, frontline clinician. And boy, have we all learned something in the last two years. <laughs> so especially in healthcare. Um, one, of, one of our participants asks, and I will just pose this to the panel. So feel free to jump in whoever uh, wants to take it first. But given the changes that came with the pandemic, do you believe the DNP and our FNP students faced challenges in applying what they learned during lecture into their clinical practice? Who wants to take that first? Well, I'm going to make a comment because um, I happen to have taught uh, one of the simulation courses um, that uh, taking simulation in uh, medicine, the transition to practice course that we teach, um, we had 10 days to flip that to a virtual uh, classroom and still find ways to teach skills to teach uh, application of uh, uh, clinical thinking and judgment. And we were able to do that by using telemedicine type skills, by using um, application of new technologies that are virtual, um, um, all types of things that you wouldn't have thought about that apply in this environment. So was it a challenge? Yes. Uh, we found by actually doing studies that the skill set uh, was as good as quality through virtual simulations as many in-person simulations. So our skill set in that area has advanced tremendously. Chris, you're a DNP student as a practicing FNP. So let, let me pose this to you. Was it difficult um, in COVID making um, that transition for or putting into practice lecture into um, what you were seeing in clinics? My program is a little different, but it, it, it did, it, I don't think so. I was able to balance both, but in terms of, and is the question more of what you're learning in lecture clinically, how has it affected sort of now being in the clinical practice? And if so, when I get, when I get my students, and I think this is the cohort that I'm with now that have been completely in like pandemic mode, I would say they haven't shown any deficit in terms of what they've learned foundationally in their didactic learning space. I haven't found that deficit. So what, you know, the, the things that Laura was talking about, um, I think it really has helped because I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen that. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone else on the panel want to weigh in on this one before we go to the next? So I wanted to add to that, that we actually learned a new skill doing telehealth visits. Um, 
because my practice is house calls. At, at some point in the pandemic, we had to not visit patients, but uh, ultimately we did because we are one of the more important uh, visitor to go see patients. But in the interim, we learned to do telehealth. That was for me also a real steep curve because we did not do telehealth visits before. Uh, so we started doing that and I continued to precept students through the pandemic. Um, we did telehealth visits until we were able to go see patients in their homes. So uh, to answer the question, we actually learned more skills than we hoped for. That's amazing. Um, what about um, uh, an RN just starting their career who has worked for many community clinics for the under under uninsured and medically underserved, which is something all of you know something about, leaning toward going and working in a community health clinic, but fearful of not getting enough acute care experience might affect practice as a DNP. Any insight into this? Because I know, Chris, you would really mention, <laughs> Chris has her hand up. Excellent. Take it away. I, I, you know, I read that question and I thought that sounds like me. I didn't have a lot of acute care experience. I did a lot of also community health sort of type work. I would probably say that I did my, my hospital work, um, maybe about two or three years of that while even being in the program. So didn't have a lot, tremendous strong hospital clinical work. But when you're an NP, it's very different. It's good to have some of that acute care work for sure, but I don't think you need to have much of that. And that's coming from my experience. Can I make a, a quick comment on that as well? I think the difference between acute care and um, community-based uh, uh, clinician um, as a nurse practitioner is really the relationship you have with people. And so the types of skills that you need in this setting is really good observation, physical assessment skills, and really people skills, because the history is again, predominantly where you find the answers is listening to people and then working with them to find out what the response should be. So the acute care, while it's nice, I had trauma ICU, but it's the physical assessment skills, the people skills, the history taking, understanding their cultural environment that really is how you get to the answers that are best for that individual. As we're talking about community health, we do have a public health question. Um, Catherine, I'm gonna push this one to you. Um, we have a participant who's eager to learn more about to what extent public health and psychiatric nursing are incorporated into our curriculum. So let me say that I have had students who have said things to me like, I'm never working in mental health. I have yet to meet patients that that's not part of them, right? So we incorporate the way that we've designed your clinical work is to really look at, you know, how do we help people be well? How do we deal with acute problems when they come up? How do we help people manage their chronic illness so that they hopefully only need us a couple of times a year and not on a regular basis? And then the complex care quarters. Um, and so with that, we've looked at, um, I guess almost an integrative health approach. So mind, body, spirit, we have our psych mental health NP is working with us throughout all of that clinical time to integrate those perspectives. We are out in the communities for our clinical rotations, working in the community. Some of our community settings allow us to do education for you know, a population within the practice who may need you know, diabetes education and how in the world do I manage what it says they're supposed to do in the guidelines with the reality of what they have capacity or capability because of their living situations or health system beliefs you know, to actually integrate and be successful. So lots of public health, lots of mental health, because those are key components to a true family practice. So the question we often get is, 
the rotations, explain how the clinical rotations work. Um, what is the school's role in securing those placements? Oh, easy question. Can I do this one? <laughs> you can. <laughs> all right. So the school actually sets up all of your clinical rotations. Now, from time to time, we have students who have a preceptor they may want to work with. And we take that into account. And if we can make that happen, because you have to have contracts and all those good things, right? So if we can make that happen, we do that. We are hoping to set up your rotations within the communities in which people are actually living, because we know from the evidence that people where they do their clinical rotations tends to be where they practice. And if part of our solution to the healthcare challenges in the state of California is those underserved areas, it doesn't make sense to pull people out of them with the idea that they may never go back to them. So the other thing that we've done is we have integrated your didactic, so your book learning component with your clinical component and then a diagnostic reasoning course. So it's like a triad. So you learn about it, you do it, and then you come back and examine it. Was it the best decision? What did I miss? What went super well that you wanna share with all your colleagues so we can learn from you and we can integrate it into our own practices? So that's kind of how the clinical rotation picture is set up. Excellent. <laughs> um, another acute care question. So what is your advice for an acute care nurse who will be transitioning to a primary care um, as an NP? What adjustments should this nurse anticipate in order to make a successful transition? I'll throw it I'm out. Add to that. Okay, go Ron, <laughs> go Ron. Um, so I was in acute care before going into uh, nurse practitioner role. The adjustments I had to make was the fact that in acute care, you are focused on a patient's condition, task oriented. You, you want to do you want to do blood draw, um, start a catheter, uh, those kinds of things. And then you have the doctor to call if nothing's going right. Um, the transition to a nurse practitioner practice is that you are the doctor. You are the ones they call for anything that's not going right with the patient. And then you don't have time, if you, even if you want to, to do blood draws and start um, catheters, although I'm pretty sure when you're in acute care, you're an expert in doing that. So the transition that I had to make was to, to not have myself do all those things because I have other things that I'm, that I'm needing to address. And it's more of a global perspective versus a task-oriented perspective. Very good. What about an oncology nurse? An oncology nurse who is looking at um, uh, what a current oncology DNPs look like. I know we've got a primary care focus, but obviously we want run the range. Catherine? There we go. So cancer isn't specific to the oncology setting. In family practice, we diagnose a lot of cancer in our practices, sadly. Um, so we learn about you know, what are the current treatment methods? How do we manage complications of cancer treatments or the cancer itself, both the psychosocial component of that and the medicine of that? And so when you come out of a family practice program, although we are not um, within our scope going to teach you which medicine works exactly for this particular tumor, that would be more specialized education in oncology that you would want to acquire. You will know how those classes of drugs work. You will know how to manage all of the complications, how to integrate nutritional consults and mental health consults and the supports for your patients. So I think it's actually a really nice fit 
to have that family practice so you get the lifespan component because cancer doesn't just hit the person who has it, it hits everybody from you know, the grandkids to the grandparents across that continuum. I knew that family caregiver component was going to come in with you, Catherine. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit more about kind of the diverse settings and organizations where we anticipate that students will be completing those uh, clinical rotations and perhaps where those scholarly projects will be conducted? Anybody else want to jump in? I think it's yours, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> and so the diverse settings can range from um, mobile health clinics going out to homeless encampments and the transitional housing where people are going from being unhoused to being housed and re integrating into that more typical setting. Um, we have rotations in different specialty areas. So let's say you've been on one of your rotations and you said, I absolutely want to learn more about chronic kidney disease and how to manage that in my family practice setting. Could I go hang with the nephrologist for a while? So, you know, we'll have opportunities for those or like the previous question, you know, I want to spend some more time with the oncologist because I want to ask them really key questions and I have this burning curiosity to know, right? So we'll be able to do some selectives from that perspective. As far as scholarly projects, part of it will depend upon what you as students have identified as areas that are important to you to take a look at the evidence and translate that through an implementation science approach in the healthcare setting. We also have partners who have gotten all tickled when I have said, so are there things in your practice that you really wish you had time to address where you've identified you know, why is it I write for insulin and nobody's A1C is moving, but they all smile and nod and tell me they're going to go get it when they leave, but obviously nobody's using it. You know, what's going on here? How do we figure that piece out? So there are several projects that if people wanted to say, oh, I'd really like to do that transitional care project, we have places where we can collaborate and integrate you into those practices to actually test out your idea to address the, a more positive patient experience. I think Laura has something to add. Yeah, I was gonna say the beauty of primary care um, is that you get such a strong comprehensive view from um, the full lifespan which includes every type of illness possible, that it gives you a tremendous basis for expanding into specialty areas if that's what you desire to do. Some specialty areas now require certification. Others become a specialty area that you can um, take additional coursework, take continuing education, and seek additional clinical experiences once you're a nurse practitioner. Um, because I lived in a rural community, um, I became a women's health specialist through Seeking Extra. Uh, same thing um, in pediatrics and school nursing, that required additional certification. Um, so it's it. you have to look at, does it require certification or does it require just experience and a passion and an interest? And so the variety of ways that you can go within primary care as a family nurse practitioner are just exceptional. Well, you mentioned the certification part. You know, we've got a question that more and more NP fellowships and residencies are now encouraged um, postgraduate uh, fellowships and residencies. So can FNPs do residencies or fellowships in an acute care setting? There's an acute care thing here uh, without taking additional coursework. Um, actually, no. Uh, it, the prof profession has really moved uh, 
to the expectation of certification as an acute care, um, adult general acute care nurse practitioner, but there are postgraduate program certification programs that allow you that additional experience. Um, in a rural type setting, however, where um, there's not the ability to re recruit a specialty acute care nurse practitioner, then sometimes there are opportunities to be mentored into that. It depends on the state, uh, depends on the environment. Ron, did you ever find yourself wanting to go back to acute care as an NP? Um, so I, I do, I did love doing acute care when I was in uh, as a bedside nurse. And I do, I'm rotating right now in the ED observation unit of UC Davis. Um, so it's acute care in a different scale, I want to say. It's more like an urgent care type of uh, environment. Um, the good thing about FNP is, as Laura has pointed out, it's very versatile. You can practically work anywhere. Um, you just have to pay attention to the nuances of a specific institution. Sometimes they require for somebody to practice in acute care with an ACNP. Uh, to answer that question, I have not um, um, been able to think about going to acute care, back to acute care, because the I take care of uh, older adults, seniors, elderly who are homebound, and I just hate to leave them and then they will have no uh, access to care where they are. In fact, I want to encourage everyone to look into geriatrics, gerontology, and maybe even a house call practice. I am in private practice doing house calls and I, I love it tremendously. It's very re rewarding. Nice to get that plug in there. Um, <laughs> you, Laura, you brought this up earlier and, and we've got a, a participant asking the question, if you ever feel restricted or frustrated by as an NP, DNP in certain situations, as opposed to someone who has an MD or a DO de degree, do you feel like patients seem to question your competence who maybe prefer to see a medical doctor instead? Um, what is your response to that? Well, I actually have lived through that full evolution. When I uh, became an MP at first, everyone assumed I was still just uh, a medical student and would be going on. And so I've spent years uh, explaining the role. And I think what we really find now through surveys and, um, and public preference, that the NP role is so strong and so well received and so well informed with patients nowadays that they recognize the special skill set, the people skills, along with the medical education that we have, um, that we really know how to put it all together. We really address the social determinants of health. We really look at health equity and diversity. And so we bring this holistic approach. So I will share with you that um, it, it, you're actually rated in medical groups. And I always was in the high 90s um, above 600 physicians for patient satisfaction. So I think uh, our skill set uh, as nurse practitioners puts us in a good place to convince, convince patients uh, pretty quickly um, that we have the skills, uh, the competency, and, and the, the, the benefit to their health that they're seeking. Chris, are you coming up against any of that in practice right now? Maybe people asking, why are you getting a DNP instead of going back to medical school? Or I've heard that question before. So yes, of course, I think this is a, I think this, uh, this does still come up and, and I think that there is a shift to where um, people are recognizing the value of nurse practitioners. Um, yes, you'll have those patients who will rather see a medical doctor um, and that's okay. I think what it shows is what Laura was just talking about is if we continue to practice with good clinical skills, with good listening skills and putting patient at the center of our care, they recognize that and they choose to come back to you. I think it really is about proving our, proving our worth. And I think along the ways we've already have, I think we just have a little bit more to go, but the word is that every time a patient calls me, uh, when they think I'm a physician, I remind them that I am a nurse practitioner so that they have in their head that I can take just as great care, if not better perhaps, um, than some of, some some, some of the things that they think of. So no, I think there's more work to do, but the work that we're doing is I think leading the way. Anybody else? I know, I know we're nearing the end. I just want to make sure that anyone else, um, Catherine, do you want to add to that part of the conversation? I do, because I think that often what happens is people don't understand our role, right? 
and sadly, probably as a profession, we have not done as outstanding of a job of communicating what it is that an NP brings. And that's true, whether that's with patients, although they have the luxury of experiencing what it's like to be an NP, but that's also true with our colleagues. And so, you know, there are things that as an MP, I would not even begin to want to do. That would be my MD colleague who spent eight years doing very specific training, you know, to cut people open and remove parts, not something I want to do, right? But I'm going to refer to them. There may be specialty expertise that they have that we can't provide as an NP. I also, you know, I think the day that the cardiologist called me and said, Catherine, I'd like to refer a couple of patients over to you for family practice was the day that I felt like I had actually educated really well about what an NP could do for your patients. You know, so I think really moving the needle in the evolution of understanding of roles, not that one's better than another, but we offer different things to the patient and the patient needs different things at different points in time. You know, and really, you know, in our curriculum, we actually are building interprofessional education experiences with the med students and social workers and therapy services so that we all really begin to understand each other's role and how we can complement each other. One of the roles we haven't mentioned is that of the PA, and we do have a question as to what um, distinguishes the NP model um, with the PA model. I, I, Laura, I, you want to I, take I that one? That. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm married to a PA, <laughs> and uh, so um, who's a graduate of, of UC Davis um, and was a medical uh, laboratory manager uh, for 20 years before I convinced him he should be a PA. And so, uh, you know, medicine is a team sport. Um, that this this um, setting up competition, whether it's a physician, a nurse practitioner, nurses, PA, physical therapist, you know, we're a team sport. We believe in team-based care. That's what we know is best for patients. And the patient is a part of that team. And so the hierarchy is really, um, we're working to have that go away. We all have value. It's not the initials that are so important. It's the skill set. And so like Catherine said, we each bring different type of skill sets. And it may be um, uh, an MP may be stronger in dermatology than her physician colleague. And they will share in different areas. Um, a PA in concept uh, has to practice under a physician, a nurse practitioner in many instances is, is moving to independent practice. We practice on our own license. In California, we do many of the same types of things in ambulatory patient care, uh, not in, in acute care, but in primary care, ambulatory care. So in California, the practice is very, very similar and we work very collaboratively uh, together. You talk about that independent practice. We do have a question. Is there a part of the curriculum where it teaches students to uh, set up shop, so to speak, uh, to set up their own clinic um, and all that that implies post-graduation? Catherine? So there is a course called Business Essentials <laughs> where yes, we talk about, um, some people may choose the project where they set up their own practice. Others may want to look at organizational systems and how do I understand the pieces I need to know in order to be a contributing member of the team within a practice. So in short answer, yes, you will learn. <laughs> Another quick question, hopefully a short answer. What about working during the program? Is it advised to maybe work full-time in year one, working per diem throughout the program? What's the advice there? So what I would say is a lot, three hours for every credit hour you're taking, right? So in that first year, credits range 11 to 12, so 33 to 36 hours is going to be kind of, you know, that benchmark for how much time you're going to spend with your coursework. Taking that into consideration, think about, can I do a 40-hour work week with that, or does it make more sense 
to do part time or per diem until, you know, I really get the lay of the land and I can figure out how to organize my time. Can I do, can I work more? Should I work less? I've had people with multiple children, single parent, full-time work, full-time program. You know, it just depends on your individual skill set and how much sleep you actually need. I was going to say more than say two hours a night. Um, I'm always impressed, um, maybe a little intimidated by so many of our students and what they're able to accomplish in, in addition to their coursework. Um, but that's that's really good advice. Um, that is all the questions we're going to take now. If you have one that our panel didn't answer, put it in the Q&A and we'll follow up via email. Um, that, for, that person talking about PA, I'll throw in that you can check our website for our PA program at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Um, that may be a, an avenue that you want to explore. And also, of course, our DNP FNP program, which has been the theme of this. So much more is found on our website site um, under academics programs dash uh, or slash sorry about that Jenny DNP dash FNP um, or emails your email us your questions HS dash Betty Irene Moore SON at UC Davis dot edu um, we're going to follow up with an email there is a survey there. We certainly hope that you'll take time to fill out that survey. Um, it helps us to improve our webinars. And real quickly before we log off, Catherine, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to make your biggest plug and inspire folks attending as to why they need to dive deeper, look at this program and consider a DNP FNP as their future. So you know, we're looking forward to helping you learn, learning from you learning with you, supporting you in your endeavors, and seeing the outstanding providers you will become. You know, providers who are committed to enhancing positive patient outcomes through affecting change at the practice and system levels. It will truly be a privilege to embark on this journey with you, as the only limits we have are the ones we're going to set for ourselves. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Chris. Thank you, Laura and Ron, for your perspectives. And thank you so much for joining us today. Again, look for that email. Share this webinar recording that we'll share with you tomorrow with anyone you think could benefit from it. And most of all, be well. Thanks for joining us.